Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome back to the Nano Hub U course, Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher, and we're in the middle of week four right now. And we're talk we've been talking about thermal conductance, and today we're going to break it down and look at this what's called spectral conductance. That means that the conductance at a certain frequency or wavelength or energy. And a lot of times that can tell us about how we might design a structure to block certain energy carriers um, or to enhance them relative to others, at least. And, uh, and there are some tools that we can bring to bear to this problem. So far, we've de defined the dimensional thermal conductance as the rate of heat flow between our two reservoirs that's due to a, an infinitesimal temperature difference between the two divided by that infin infinitesimal temperature. And for phonons, we developed an expression in frequency space, so it's a frequency integral. And for electrons, we do the integral by convention in energy space. And those two are shown in this slide. The only differences are that we have an h-bar term in the electron uh, in the electron result, uh, and also there's a factor of two that's different that comes from the up and down spin or the spin degeneracy of electrons. Today we're going to talk about spectral conductance. So what we'd like to do is to is to divide this up into a into frequency space and look at where the conductance peaks. That's usually what what folks are interested in is where where's my maximum uh, maximum conductance and frequency or energy space. So what we've done here is we've, we're, we're defining a spectral conductance as g prime sub q. So the prime is the only thing that tells you it's spectral. It's actually essentially the integrand from the full conductance expression on the previous slide. So for phonons and electrons, again, the number of modes we express for phonons in, in terms of frequency, and for electrons, we express the number of modes m in terms of energy. Everything else is pretty much the same, except for that pesky uh, chemical potential mu that shows up in the electron expression. And that comes from the replacement carriers that, that have to come in and replace any, any other carrier that's transporting, that's, that's contributing to transport. And still, I'll apologize, we still haven't, uh, haven't actually gone through the transmission function with any uh, degree of rigor. That's the subject for next week. What I'd like to do today is to, is to talk about a normalized spectral conductance. And I want to explain why we do it this way. We're actually going to take the spectral conductance and divide it by the factors that are shown here. Are some constant that depends on whether we're talking about electrons or phonons that's listed in this slide. Boltzmann's constant, it's just the constant that divides out. Uh, M, our number of modes, so we're going to actually divide by the number of modes. So you can kind of think of this as a conductance per mode, and then the transmission function, that script T. And we're going to introduce a, a variable chi, and it's going to have a, a, essentially the same definition for phonons and electrons, except for the electron energy is relative to the chemical potential as we discussed before. That's the only, only real difference in chi. But if you go back to the top equation here, you can see that this normalized spectral conductance, and the way to know that it's normalized is the tilde on top. This normalized spectral conductance is itself dimensionless. All the terms in the equation are dimensionless. It's the, uh, the distribution function squared multiplied by e raised to the chi, which is really just e raised to a normalized energy because chi is a normalized energy, and then multiplied by chi squared. Okay, so that's the normalized spectral conductance. It's dimensionless, and later on, probably in the next lecture, we'll see how that's a, a fairly valuable thing. It, it can help to explain some features of, of uh, different phenomena that have been ob observed through measurements and other theory. So if I plot this phonon spectral conductance that is normalized, so that's g tilde prime. I know it's getting very complicated with the the nomenclature here, but but bear with me. I think you'll find that it's worth it. Uh, we plot that as a function of chi, and 
we find that that actually for very low values of, of chi, that means that energies that are much less than the thermal energy, that's KBT, we have a, a unit value for this spectral conductance, this normalized spectral conductance. So you can kind of think of this as every mode is contributing about the same to the conductance. And then once the energy h bar omega reaches the thermal energy, that's a value of one on the x-axis, the, the normalized spectral conductance drops off fairly rapidly. And by the time it reaches a value of 10, so 10 times more energy than thermal energy, uh, it, that, that uh, spectral conductance is just about negligible. So our expectations are that, that essentially all of the low energy modes are going to contribute just about the same to uh, thermal conductance, and then the high energy modes will start to tail off. And it's interesting, as, as you look at this, if you had to guess what the value of the integral is, so that is the integral of g tilde prime over chi, you'd see that g tilde prime takes a value of 1 up until about the point where chi equals 1, and then it drops off. So roughly speaking, we would expect the value of an integral under this curve to be of order of magnitude 1. Later on, that's going to be important. In the next lecture, we'll talk specifically about, about that, uh, that particular integral. For the electrons, it's a little bit different, and we talked a bit in the last lecture about why, in essence, when we're exactly at the chemical potential, that means that chi equals zero, that the replacement electrons are at the same energy as the transporting electrons, and so there's really no net conductance from them. But on the left and the right, and, and for about a value of the, the peaks here, we'll talk a little bit about the peak conductances, for values of kind of between zero and five in magnitude of chi, we get a, a spike in the, in the conductance. And so that's also important to understand what range of energies are contributing to thermal conductance. I'm gonna do one extra thing here with this normalized spectral conductance. We're gonna recognize that when we calculated the number of modes, we found that the number of modes was proportional to the wave vector raised to the power d minus one, where d is the dimensionality of the problem. We're trying to keep things as general as we can. And so what we'd like to do is to, is to take a little bit of that number of modes and, and pull it out and multiply it by this normalized uh, spectral conductance, because it will, that will also tell us some interesting things about the transport. In fact, it's going to give us the, the peak uh, frequencies or energies at which conductance is, mac is maximum. So we're going to talk specifically about phonons here where you have a capital K and we'll get to electrons in a moment. But instead of expressing M as a, as a K to the power D minus 1, what we're going to do is to say that we're going to replace K with chi. So chi, remember, is proportional to energy. And we're going to take moments of this of this uh, normalized spectral conductance with respect to chi. A moment means I'm multiplying by chi or chi squared or chi cubed. And the reason that we would do that is that we know, generally speaking, that we have a relationship between k and chi. That comes from the dispersion relation. And if I'm taking an exponent of k, I'm going to take some exponent of chi, and in, in different dimensionalities, we would think that this exponent alpha is important as we look at the spectral conductance. This is a weighted spectral conductance now. So we go ahead and do that. Now we're plotting instead of just the spectral conductance as a function of chi, we're plotting the weighted spectral conductance as a function of chi. And what we see is that when alpha equals zero, of course, we have the same curve. That's the blue curve that we had before. But when alpha equals 1, that would correspond to a two-dimensional problem because d would be 2. And if we had, for phonons, if we use the Debye approximation, that's sort of the, the overriding assumption here, at least the one that we're going to interpret these results through. For alpha equals 1, that would correspond to d minus 1 equals 1. That means that the dimensionality of the problem would be 2. And now we see an interesting difference from what from the blue curve, from the alpha equals zero curve, which is what we 
showed before, we actually see a peak. So there's a peak value in this weighted spectral conductance. And then for alpha equals 2, which corresponds to a three-dimensional problem, we see another peak. It's a little bit shifted from the alpha equals 1 peak. And I've put in here also alpha equals 3 because there are some special cases where that might be a useful thing to know. So that's where uh, we might have a different kind of dispersion relation other than the by that we might want to use. And what we see here is, in general, we see peaks. Um, so we have peaks in the, in the weighted spectral conductance, which is normalized. And the value of chi where the peak occurs is important because that essentially tells us that that's the normalized energy in these different dimensionalities that uh, where, where heat conductance is maximum. Once we have that, we can go back to the dispersion curve and we can say, well, for that energy, what is the, or that energy or frequency, what is the corresponding wavelength? And we can calculate a, a wavelength that maximizes or where thermal conductance is maximum. So if we look at those peaks, now what I've done here is we've calculated the peaks for the different values of alpha. So for alpha equals zero, that's that corresponds to a one-dimensional material because d minus one is zero for a one-dimensional material, and there's no peak. For a two-dimensional material, we have a peak when chi equals 2.58. So you can think of that as being two and a half, roughly two and a half times the thermal energy. That's where the conductance is the maximum. For three-dimensional materials, the peak shifts out a little bit to the right to a higher value of chi to 3.8. And then the special case, uh, when alpha equals three, we have a, a peak at 4.93. So I've done here, there's a lot of words in this slide, but I wanted to do an example calculation. I'll tell you that you know, most of the examples that we do are homeworks, and, and we actually have homework problems that we solve out and record. So I don't do too many example problems during the lectures, but for this case, I, I wanted to just kind of walk you through the process. Um, so here we have, for a three-dimensional material, and we've chosen aluminum, we have a, a peak, in the conductance when h bar omega equals 3.83 times kBT. So that corresponds to the alpha equals two condition because it's a three dimensional material. We go back and we calculate the corresponding value of omega and it's listed here. And this by the way is for a particular temperature. We've chosen T equals 77 Kelvin, that's liquid nitrogen temperature so that it's well below the Debye temperature. We've already kind of half made the the Debye approximation here, at least in, in thinking that, that alpha equals two corresponds to, to this three-dimensional three material. Then what we need to do from there to calculate the corresponding wavelength, we have to go back and know the Debye temperature because if we know the, the frequency at which conductance peaks, then we need the dispersion curve to go back and, course, and calculate the wavelength. Well, the dispersion curve under the Debye approximation is just a line, so we need to know what the group velocity is. And if you go back in our notes, and if you can look up aluminum's Debye temperature of 394, um, we also would need in this case to know the atomic density of aluminum, which is listed here. And what we're doing, just so you know, in this approximation, we're actually using all six of the phonon branches uh, for the uh, for the Debye approximation. We talked about that uh, a few lectures ago about being careful about whether you're only looking at the acoustic modes or also including the uh, optical modes. In this case, we're including them all, and so we're using the full atomic density uh, as opposed to the density of the, the uh, uh, unit cells. And we calculate that then using all of these different factors. We can, can compute an average group velocity. So this is the Debye group velocity of uh, around 3,000 meters per second. So once we have that, we can go back and calculate the peak uh, wave vector, that's the peak K corresponding to the, the frequency at which the peak occurs from the Debye approximation. And that turns into uh, the value listed here about 10 to the 10th radians per meter. And then we use the k equals 2 pi over wavelength and calculate a wavelength, which turns out to be about 0.5, about a half a nanometer. 
And if we compare that to the average interatomic spacing of aluminum, which is about it's about half of that value. So um, it's actually in this case, you know, even though it's a fairly low temperature, uh, the the wavelength is fairly short. So this is important because if you wanted to, for example, take advantage of wave effects on thermal conductivity, what you would have to do, at least if you wanted to affect the place where the thermal conductance peaks, you'd really have to get down and, and add features to the aluminum to the lattice that have a, a length scale of about a half a nanometer in order to affect that. Uh, and that that's maybe not so easy all the time to get uh, features that are that small. So the last slide here is for electrons. We use eta as the as the exponent on chi in this weighted spectral conductance. Um, and the reason we use eta is that it's generally going to stand for something different than alpha in terms of dimensionality because the dispersion relation is different. So in this case, we have a uh, k is proportional to energy to the power of one half. And so eta corresponds to uh, the, the dimensionality minus one, all divided by two. And so we see here that, uh, that we have, again, this peaking behavior. In this case, we do have a peak in eta. You, if you recall back, again, the statistics that we're using are different. But if you recall back, uh, we had a peak in the, uh, in the curves for uh, just the, the straight conductance, the regular uh, conductance for the electronic for electronic problems, and so that also shows up when eight, eight equals zero here, and it happens at about a value of between two and three and a half uh, for these different values of eta, each of which corresponds to a dimensionality of the problem, at least if we have parabolic bands. So eta equals one would correspond to uh, a value a three dimensional problem. Eta equals 0.5 is a two dimensional problem, and eta equals zero is a one-dimensional problem. Again, the peaks are not too different. I, I also mentioned here that I'm only showing one half of this. Chi in this case, we're assuming that uh, for, for this problem, for, for this part of the, uh, this is a special case where mu is zero. Mu is assumed to be zero for, for these electrons. I just wanted to show kind of half of the curve here. All right, so thank you for your attention and we'll talk more next time.